Um, so there are two uh, serious proposals for trying to understand near symmetry. One of them is uh, Strumming or Young Zaslow. So they suggest that uh, if you have a space X, then its mirror Y should be understood as a dual torus fibration. That is, there's a common base, and the fibers are at least generically tori. And in the original conjecture, um, you know, there's additional conditions where you assume these vibrations. This is a symplectic manifold, but actually it's a calabiao equipped with a Kähler form, uh, in which case you want to require this vibration to be some special Lagrangian vibration. And by dualizing it, you would expect, you would hope to produce a, a dual vibration. Um, that would be the mirror club, yeah. So that's, that's the picture for Strumming or Yanzo. The uh, other picture that is due to Kimsevich is homological near symmetry. That says that um, in this case, x and y, let's focus it just in one direction. We'll think about x as a symplectic manifold. And y as some sort of algebraic variety, even though we'll see later it's not necessarily algebraic variety, but for now let's just pretend. So in the homological mirror symmetry, the, the suggestion is that you look at the Fukai category of X. And this is some category with objects, uh, Lagrangian, plus X kid beta. And on the algebraic side, you look at the category of coherent sheaves on Y. And while these things may not be directly comparable by passing through some appropriate derived category, you get an equivalence. So the list of um, examples for which we, Calabiao examples for which we know this is actually fairly short. We know this for, um, let me do it on the symplectic side. X uh, is a torus. We know this for case where X is a K3 K surface, well, let me really I should say quartic K3 surface. Quart quartic K3 is what we call that. We know this for the analogous um, Calabiaus. <coughs> this is work on Calabiao hypersurface loop in CPN. This is work of Sheridan. And we know this, I mean, it's kind of shameful to put this, but we know this for products of the above. So I did this with Ivan Smith a few years back. So this is a very, fair, fairly short list. And in particular, uh, you'll notice about this list is that you know all of these things are very specific symplectic structures. If you start deforming the symplectic structure a little bit, then you lose the ability to. If it's, no, it, it, the, the, the proof has to be sufficiently strong. So let me just say, it's not enough to know these equivalences of categories. You have to know that these categories uh, that you are working with are, are good in the sense that, um, well, there is a word for it in the sense, in the sense that there have to be enough coherent sheaves, in the sense that you can resolve, so let me just say it on the algebraic side. You take y cross y, you take the diagonal of y cross y, and you need to know that that object, as an object of the category of coherent sheaves on y cross y, has a resolution that comes from things on the, that coming from, from the two factors. Once you know this fact, then you put in a bunch of homological algebra, and you can produce something like this. But if you had a space, if you had just some knowledge, I don't know how, would, how you'd be able to prove it, but if you just happen to take two manifolds the Fukai category is famous coherent sheaves, but you didn't have this extra additional knowledge about the categories, then you would not necessarily be able to conclude it for the products. Um, 
questions. It's a very good question. But it's not a completely general fact. It requires having enough objects. Um, OK. So, uh, so th there's an idea of Kenji Fukaya from about 15 years ago. Uh, so Fukaya suggested that we should prove that we should um, prove homological mirror symmetry via uh, via using XYZ, XYZ duality. And the idea basically is that the is that Y is just a moduli space of objects of f of x. To be precise, maybe I should say simple objects uh, supported on the fibers. And maybe I should give things names. We call this pi on the object of pi on the fibers of pi. So what does that mean? Well, in this very simple setting here, uh, if f p, this is some fiber. So I have a pair f p nabla, where this is a unitary local system on uh, f p. So given our pair fp and abla, I should produce point in y. And that's the meaning of the statement that y is the, the five, uh, y is the thing by dualizing x, just passing from the torus itself, the unit of local systems on the torus, uh, is basically dualizing. Point, so it's a given fp, which is a point in y, and a Lagrangian, general Lagrangian, let's say L, Inside X, we can form a group, Euler cohomology group, cohomology group. Let's now let's just call it for now H F star of L with the pair F P comma nabla, and the assertion that we should prove homological mirror symmetry via X Y Z duality is the statement that these groups should be again, uh, the, the fibers of the coherent sheaf. I'm going to put quote unquote here because of this problem with having to pass as a drive category, but let's ignore it again for now, of the coherent sheaf on Y, which is mirror. L. So, mirror homological mirror symmetry tells you to a Lagrangian, you should be assigned to be able to assign a coherent sheaf. Again, up to ignoring the derived problem. So, there should be a functor from here. We're going to take the functor to go from here to here. How do you take this assignment? Fukai's suggestion is that this assignment is essentially tautological. If you can make it, if you can check the right thing, you take a Lagrangian, the point. The coherent sheaf, you want to think of it as a family of vector spaces varying in some controlled way over y, and the family of vector spaces is just going to be these Euler cohomology groups. Okay. So what are the difficulties in making this precise? So the first difficulty is the obvious difficulty on anything involving XYZ duality, which is that uh, how to dualize singular fibers. Pi. Second difficulty is problems coming from the fact that while this group makes sense, it's very hard to understand it when the projection uh, from L to Q changes, uh, you know, has different, the ranks of the fibers, um, sorry, the number of points in the fiber changes at different points. 
So the second difficulty, I would say, comes from caustics of the projection from L to Q. And the last difficulty has to do with convergence in fluor cobalt. So already here, I s pretended that I'm going to take a fiber and take a unitary local system. I didn't say what coefficients I was using. In the XYZ proposal, originally X was a Clavial, complex Clavial. Y is a complex Clavial. So if you go through this dualization procedure and you believe that you will produce uh, a coherent sheaf on Y, uh, then in particular, you need to make sure that you can do fluor cohomology over the complex numbers. In that means that you, when you count, whatever is fluor cohomology is going to count some things, that count has to converge. And this is something that we, of course, do not know, and certainly not in this setting, certainly not in this general. So today, um, just a rough summary, we ignore this, ignore this problem. By ignore this problem, I basically mean I will work in a setting where there is no singular fiber. And we, so I will, um, resolve this problem in the standard way by working um, over the Novikov, over something called the Novikov field. I'll come back to this in a second. And uh, finally, um, this caustics, maybe this is the main point, is that uh, we also resolve this by perturbation. By maybe instead of saying perturbation, I say by using continuation maps. And, and I have to say, kind of the seed, you know, there's been, if you try to think about what, see what's been done before, um, you know, Fukaya had, you know, contributions for two and for three, but I think he's been too distracted in the last five years by other things. N things have never been actually put together um, in the way that I'm going to say. But definitely the ideas here are related to some things that have appeared in Fukaya. Okay, so let's. Where was it? It is a fiber. Yeah. Fiber of pi at P. P is a point in Q. Sorry, maybe I didn't make that clear. There's an X of P somewhere? Oh, somebody else may write an X of P, maybe. I won't. Um, okay. So, so now let me, before I can say anything meaningful, I have to describe to you what is this ring that is going to show up. So uh, that's, that, that's where we start doing uh, non-Archimedean geometry. So, so lambda is called the Novikov field. The way I think about it is that its elements are series. And for simplicity in this talk, we will do the Novikov field over the complex numbers. A series uh, AI lambda I. AI are complex numbers. The series is given by uh, I goes, let's say, from zero to infinity. Um, lambda I are real numbers. And the limit as I goes to infinity of lambda I is equal to infinity. So the way to think about this is you write down a series. You allow yourself to write down real exponents, which is, not, which is unusual. But you require the following condition. If you bound the degree, there's only finitely many terms. That's really the way to think about this. Only finitely many terms. Of bounded degree. And the reason this condition is important is that it is related by Gromov compactness. This is some sort of algebraic uh, trace of Gromov compactness, which says, again, in under the right assumptions, that there are only 
finitely many um, index zero regular holomorphic holomorphic curves of bounded energy. Okay, once you, you have to pick, you pick the genus case. Um, so bounded energy goes to degree, and the fact that you have Gromov compactness, which tells you that you have only finitely many things when you're studying kind of holomorphic curves in symplectic topology, leads to this finite to this uh, to being able to work over these things. And since the energy in symplectic topology is generically just a real number, you you can't do anything in general, in complete generality, you can't do better than this. So that's the that's the Novikov field that we will be studying. There's two. There's one main um, auxiliary thing that I want to talk about, which is that inside lambda, so there's a, there's a valuation map from lambda to R. It takes uh, it, it takes it takes um, a series like this to the leading order term. Going to a zero um, if lambda zero is less than, let's say lambda one, less than all the other ones. So this is the leading order term. And there are two, there's a subring of this that is important to think about. It's the <laughs> ring of integers, lambda zero. These are the, um, the elements of positive uh, non-negative valuation. Um, the way I set it up, it should be from zero to infinity. So this means there is no negative power showing up. And inside of here, uh, no, I did something wrong. Well, okay, you have to, you have to also be able to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just, add infinity here uh, because there's a special case of zero. Zero goes to infinity. And then inside of here there is uh, the units. These are the elements of uh, valuation equal to zero. So just let me just make sure that things are explicit. This is the set of things which leading order term A0 plus O, well higher O plus um, the sum of a i t to the lambda i, where a zero is not equal to zero and lambda i is strictly greater than zero. Okay. So these units play the role. No, if we these these play the role of S one of S one inside complex numbers. So in particular. The correct interpretation of this unitary local system on SP, the one that's the, the interpretation that will make sense in general, is to think of this unitary local system as a local system with value with with monodromy uh, in this in this U lambda. So um, we define. Um, so we sorry we obtain Fleur groups. Cohomology groups or pairs F P comma blah blah where nabla blah is a local system rank one lo local system uh, with monodromy in u lambda, but really what this means is the set of things is classified by h upper one of sp with coefficients in u lambda. That's that's the groups that we're talking. About. Okay, so now that I've introduced at least the the, the the field that I'm going to work with, let me now uh, explain what I mean by we will ignore this problem of uh, singular 
vibration. So we go back to this picture. And now, so assume that x over q, this is nice vibration, this is, is a smooth Lagrangian vibration. With, and moreover, I'll assume that x is compact. So what this means, I have this x, I have omega, which I have not even note, note, talked about. This is a symplectic form. I have this projection from x to q, and I assume the fibers are Lagrangian submanifolds, and they're all smooth. Now there is a result of a mold, called the annulled uvule theorem. It essentially says that, uh, well, it essentially says the fibers of pi are tori. I mean, it says, it says it's, it's much more precise than this. In particular, um, it gives you the following information. It gives you a canonical identification between the tangent space of the base So if P is a point in the base, it gives you a canonical identification between the tangent space of, of Q and the first cohomology of the fiber at that point with R coefficients. And of course, this contains in it H upper 1 of FP with Z coefficients. Um, So let's write, so this means that we obtain a lattice. Let me call it TZ, Q, inside the tangent space of Q. <coughs> so of course I can take, think about the total space. And this, this lattice has some special properties. The sections that are locally defined um, the du dual sections are, are locally defined as the differentials of functions, but that may show up later, not necessarily right now. Uh, but the most important thing that I want to say is that since I have this lattice, I can just form a space. Well, right now it's just going to be a set, really, uh, which will be y as a set, uh, which is going to be this tangent space which I think of as fibered over Q in lattices, tensored over Z with mu lambda. Okay? I.e., if we undo all of this, fibers of over a point P um, is H upper 1 of FP with coefficients in mu lambda, which Going back to what I said over here, the fibers are the kind of data that I can put um, that I can put on FP, so that then I can take pleural cohomology of FP with any Lagrangian. So that's what I, that's in the set. That's how you make this idea precise in this setting. You don't have to talk about moduli spaces of objects in the Fukai category. You can just talk about these fibers equipped with local fields. So now it's just a set, uh, but the claim is that there is enough structure here that this y is, um, is the rigid analytic space. So that's, this, is ob this observation is <coughs> essentially due to, I would say, Kinsevich and Soibelman. y is uh, naturally Rigid analytic space. So what does this mean? So this means um, the idea is that you, we are going to do 
uh, we're going to do constructions not over the complex numbers but over this field. But instead of our constructions being algebraic, instead of doing algebraic geometry over this, we're going to do something that looks like doing complex analysis over this. That's one way to say this. Um, and the, the easiest way to produce this is, we the easiest way to produce this rigid analytic structure is by giving charts. So obtain charts, which are called affinoid, you can think of them as actually an affinoid coven, cover, but let me just call them charts, for y i affinoid. domains as follows. So the first thing you do is you realize that this um, affine structure can locally be identified with the affine structure on Rn. So there exists um, so up to LF, up to the action action of um, FLN Z semi-direct product Rn. There exists canonical charts for for Q first. For Q, in which you basically take a polygon. Let's say take a, let's say the neighborhood of the point P. Take uh, so I take P. It lives in Q. I'm going to take a neighborhood P, so little P, big P, um, and I can map this to R n in such a way that this lattice, the tangent space, the integral tangent space of the point, uh, which I guess anyway, uh, maps to the standard lattice V n. So when I, when I look at the map on tangent spaces, I take this lattice to this lattice. And these charts, as, as I said, so they're, they're canonical up to the action of this group because you have to preserve this lattice and down here, those are the only actions that preserve this lattice. Now, once you're in this situation, once you know that you have these um, charts that actually embed in Rn, we can assume, and I will do this from now on, we assume that the image of P in Rn is an integral affine polygon. What does it mean to be an integral affine polygon? It means it's defined by, there exists um, alpha i that live in Vn and real numbers mu sub i such that p is equal to the set of points u such that, um, well maybe here I have to do the dual but that's okay, alpha i u uh, is greater than or equal to mu i. So it's, it's a polygon. The, uh, the distance between these faces and the origin can be any real number but the normal direction has to be integral. So I said that I would produce some charts for y. And I'm going to do this starting, uh, just to, for most convenience, to do is starting with this, with covering uh, q. Oh my god. Um, we can cover q by integral affine polygons whose intersections are again integral affine polygons. Well, fixed, later on we'll have to make it smaller, but for now, fix a cover uh, pi of q by integral affine polygons so that all iterated intersections are, and here I said iterated, I did not write it, are again integral affine polygons.
And then what I do is I say, well, I have PI. It lives inside uh, Rn. And over Rn, I have, well, <coughs> remember, I have this valuation. It goes from lambda to R union infinity. So if I remove 0, it goes to R. So what I can do is I can take lambda star to the n. And I map lambda star to the n. Let's say an element in here is going to be a bunch of functions, f1 to fn. And I just take f1 to fn to the valuation of f1, valuation of fn. <coughs> Great. Um, I mean, I should probably call this pie chart, but anyway, I, I just want to call this evaluation. So I can take the inverse image of pi, and I will call this yi. So this is the inverse image of this. It consists of all of all elements of lambda star to the n that have these values. So this kind of, I mean, in the sense of Tate. This is what you might have called an affinoid domain. So whatever it is, Tate says, you can take these spaces, sets like this, as building blocks, the analogs of charts of a complex manifold. Uh, you, you, know, you can use these as the analogs of uh, Charts uh, uh, of a complex manifold. So, in particular, we have um, we have these for every. So, we have y i uh, for every p i, and actually, for every p i j, we have something called y i j, and we have maps. And one can check without too much difficulty that whatever these maps are, they're basically induced by <laughs> translation and action by SLNT. So it turns out that that action lifts to lambda star to the n. Um, and it lifts by automorphisms of the correct algebraic structure. So we can glue y, um, so obtain y as By glue. Now, of course, now that I've said this is we obtain y by gluing, we still have to compare it to the original thing. The original thing was some sort of canonical thing. We just used the lattice and we tensored it with u lambda. We obtain this test. Um, but this is not too hard. I mean, the key thing is to is to compare uh, the fibers at any point. I mean, once I mean, you can you just I wanna, we just want to identify this set with that space obtained by gluing. And, uh, and I just want to say that this embedding uh, of P inside Rn, this is like choosing a basis for uh, H upper one or H lower one, doesn't really matter, uh, with Z coefficients. Okay? So under that choice of basis, um, you can identify H1 of FP with U lambda, with U lambda to the n, and copies of U lambda. But this is exactly the fiber of this valuation map. Val inverse of, it's really the, if you put 0, 0, 0, but all the fibers are the same because you can just translate an Rn. So this is the space we're talking about. We are, when we say, you know, when we want to do mirror symmetry and in a setting where we don't have convergence, you could do very delicate things where you work over the, this Novikov ring, lambda zero, but if you're not doing such delicate things, you just want to prove an equivalence of categories, the likeliest place you're going to manage to prove equivalence of categories is over the Novikov field. So this sheaves on this space should correspond to the Vizcaya category, because that those are the two things that can be most easily compared. So now I have to tell you 
what it means, oops, sorry, I have like 20 seconds. Uh, what does it mean that I will, given L inside X, the idea is that we are going to produce sheaves, um, sheaves, let us call these sheaves H, K, script L. And this is going to, this notation is suggesting something. It's suggesting that really we're trying to produce, producing some complexes and then those complexes have cohomologies and those cohomologies are the sheaves that we're taking um, whose fibers are H at some point are these Fleur cohomology groups. This is what we get. But again, the way to do this um, is suggested by this gluing construction. What you want to do is you want to produce um, sheaves on each of the yi's and isomorphisms between their overlaps. I mean, between their, their, uh, their restrictions to the overlaps. That's what we're going to do. Use a uh, description of y as obtained from couples. And now these spaces yi, uh, there's word affinoid in there, I mean they're called affinoids. One of the things that they satisfy is that sheaves on yi are just modules over a ring. Coherent sheaves, maybe I didn't, anyway, coherent sheaves on I is the same as, you know, basically finite. Let me just call them just to be precise, coherent modules. We're not even we don't even need to know what it means to be a coherent module uh, over uh, the structure sheaf. O I. So I'll just write this, and this is the structure sheaf. But really, here I'm. I should say the ring of functions. Let me just do that. Ring of functions. What do these ring of functions look like? So it's it's easiest if I instead of doing the most general situation, I just do uh, let's do dimension one. So lambda star maps to R, and here, this polygon that we're talking about, it's just an interval. Let's let that interval be A to B, and this is the inverse image, I'll call this here for now. And I'd like to know, what, what do I, when I talk about this ring of functions, what am I talking about? Well, the way to think about it is that, let's start with lambda star. What is a function on lambda star? Well, for a moment, let's do a step back and let's talk about what is a function on C star. You should think of that as basically a Laurent polynomial. Well, so th that's on lambda star, but it's a Laurent series if you're talking about this. Some AI. Um, now I'm going to put Z to the I, where AI lives in lambda. That's what a general element um, of, that's what, well, that's what you would think of as a function on lambda star. It should, it's allowed to have to go to minus infinity, minus infinity to plus infinity. But if we're studying this set, we'd like to require that, these, that this function converges, converges if z lies in this domain. And converges in one sense. Well, converges in the theatic sense, in the, well, in the sense of valuation. So this is an adic convergence. More precisely, what this means is that um, the, the limit as i goes to infinity um, of the valuation of a i plus i times 
uh, the valuation of the endpoint, which is B, okay, you'd like for this to be infinity. And similarly, uh, the valuation of AI minus I times B, uh, is that. this is basically the startup condition. You put a growth condition on these coefficients to make sure that whenever you plug in something which lies in, which has this valuation, you, you only get finitely many terms uh, below a given, below a given, um, below a given degree. So what we need to see, so the, the claim is that something like this, we're going to be able to produce uh, from Fleur theory, a module over this ring. So how do we do it? So let's assume for simplicity that we have a Lagrangian which is transverse to a fiber. So first, let me tell you what this script L is going to be. Okay, so there's some coherent module over this, but really there's going to be some complex of free modules. I'm going to take their cohomology. So pick uh, a neighborhood. So again, integral affine polygon, but I'm just going to stop saying that. A neighborhood P, capital P, if you like any. And it has to satisfy at least the following properties. And we'll see that in the end, this is not enough such that x p prime is transverse to L for all p prime in P. So I have my P here. I have some Lagrangian which is transverse to it, uh, which is transverse to this fiber. And I want to take a neighborhood such that at least, so this is the minimal condition we see this is not enough, but for now let's pretend that this is enough. So that all the fibers, um, a neighborhood of P such that all the fibers P over points in it, all S P prime, are still transverse. That basically says the number of intersections is constant. Now we want to find to, to form um, a module over this ring, and as a vector space, it's easy to form. So let script L of P denote the direct sum over all intersection points with this fixed fiber. With uh, think of it as a reference; it's a base point. Um, of copies of um, of copies of the free module. So I'm going to put for now y o of y p, even though notation is a little bit cumbersome, labeled by this intersection point. So it's 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 finite rank because there's only finitely many intersection points. Free module over this over this, and then we want to define the differential. And to define the differential, you have to make some choices. And the main choice you have to do is you have to pick, um, is really just a homotopy class, but a homotopy class of paths from um, x, which is an intersection point, to a base point. Let's call it for now x0 which lives in SP. So the picture that I have in mind, it's not very informative, is I have, this is my fiber SP, here my X0. I see some intersection points, here's X, and here's some other intersection in Y. And I choose this, I, I have to pick this path that goes from here to here. But of course, this is a, this is a, you know, this is a torus. So for this guy, I may not be picking this path, I may be picking this path. There's no canonical choice of these paths. I, I could be kind of going back. Okay. 
make going around. That's that's life. Okay. So given this choice of homotopy class as a path, we can assign to each holomorphic strip. In fact, it doesn't need to be holomorphic to each strip. Uh, let's call it V that goes from uh, the disk. So it's mapped from a disk to X, which takes this boundary to SP and this boundary to L and takes these two points to intersections. Let's call this little X and little Y for now. We can assign to each map like this a homology class which I will call the class of the boundary of V, and it lives in H lower 1 of SP with V coefficients. So how do I produce this homology class? Uh, the picture is very simple. So it's, it's better, again, if I, here's X, here's Y, and let's take a strip. This is the kind of strip you would run into. You restrict the strip to the boundary. And when you restrict the strip to the boundary, you get a path along the boundary from x to y. And now you can catenate the path from x to y with the path from y to the base point that you fixed earlier, and then with the path from the base point to x. And uh, out of that, you get a loop. And that loop has a homology class in h lower 1. So this is the choice that you, you have to make this choice in order for one to, to proceed. So now I can tell you what is the differential. So the differential, uh, and I'm not going to, of course, uh, on LP is defined well by counting. What you do is that d of x is equal to the sum over all y of some number, which we'll come back to in a second. And then you multiply that. Um, actually, let me just, instead of doing like this, I'll just do some of V, which is a strip from Y to X, rigid strip. Y of t to the, uh, the, pull the area of v, which is basically v integral of v star of omega, times z, that's this z here. Oops, that's, no, not this z here. That's this z here. Um, to the class of the boundary of v. So this is the, this is the expression. Uh, for the differential. And what I want to say basically is that um, there is, you know, this looks like the differential on, uh, on ordinary Fleur homology on CF star if you set z equals 1. And maybe one more thing to say is that here I'm writing z to a power, which is a class in h lower 1 of f with z coefficients. But of course, if you choose a trivialization, this is just in something in zn. And the analog of um, Laurent polynomials in one variable, where you're allowed z to the i, where i is an integer, is that, well, you have several coefficients, z1, z2, z3, z4, and you can raise e each of them to a positive or a negative power. That would be a, a Laurent mon monomial in general. So. When you write down this expression, you at least have an element of, well, you infinitesimally, you have an element of this, basically you have an element of this ring when this annulus, when this interval here is, is has length zero. That's what you really are getting. So the question is, why does this expression converge? Why? does this converge um, in the sense of attic convergence? 
And the, the answer is basically like this. So if I plug in z equals, let's say, t to the alpha, okay, then I get t to the, you know, integral of omega times uh, plus alpha. And this number here, the integral of omega plus alpha, this is a good approximation. So here I can't be precise. This approximates the area of a holom of the whole of the holomorphic disk. Holomorphic strip with boundary on L and F P plus alpha. Okay, so the picture is as follows. Again, let me go back, to, maybe I'll just redraw it. I have my F P here. I have my L. And when I try to understand convergence of this function, basically what I have to do is I have to plug in for Z points which lie on this um, on, uh, on this affinoid Y, which basically means points that correspond to nearby fibers, okay, nearby fibers of my Lagrangian fibration. So let's take such a fiber and just abuse notation and write such a fiber as F P plus alpha using this uh, basically trivialization of the base. And now the area of this holo original holomorphic disk, this is u star of omega, uh, integral of u star of omega. And the claim is that this area that you get by moving the, the Lagrangian, it's not exactly this, but it can be approximated by this well enough that you can control convergence. So this is approximately integral v star of omega. So that's the idea, and that would work if you knew that there was no, that the moduli spaces of holomorphic disks did not have, were basically constant. There was no, no bifurcation in the moduli space. And that's not, of course, that's, nothing guarantees that for you. Uh, you could think that if you choose a neighborhood smaller and smaller, sufficiently small neighborhood, it would hold, but that even there it's not guaranteed for you because it would only hold up to bounded energy. So there's a problem. What if there is jumping, or let's say bifurcation, in the moduli space? in arbitrarily small neighborhoods. And here the solution, uh, this is just an adaptation of an idea that Fukaya used in the case where there is only one Lagrangian. So I'll just say that Fukaya, an idea of Fukaya tells you that what you should do is you should just pick a diffeomorphism just a diffeomorphism, not a complex morphism. C, which takes, which preserves L and takes F of P to F of P prime and preserves the tameness of J. Okay, I haven't said anything about J. There's some almost complex structure floating around which we're using to define all these things. If fibers are sufficiently close, and you can choose a diffeomorphism that preserves the tameness of J that still allows you to do J-holomorphic curves, uh, J-holomorphic curve theory, and takes fibers to fibers and preserves L. That's just a basic exercise in differential topology. But if this is true, then you get a canonical identification of moduli spaces of spaces of strips and once you get this canonical identification of moduli spaces of strips you can appeal to Gromov compactness 
for the nearby fiber. So Gromov compactness. Remember, Gromov compactness for P, for this fixed fiber, is what allows us to know that Fleur homology is well defined. And when we write down these differentials, there's only finitely many curves that show up when we set V equals to 1. But then you can apply, when you know this, you can apply Gromov compactness for the nearby fiber to see that there's only finitely many terms of bounded exponent that show up, even when you plug in Z, uh, which is not 1. So this tells you convergence in Y to P. So I'm almost out of time. Uh, I will say just two things. So once you know this, uh, you, this already tells you that you should go back to the beginning and you should not pick your, I said you, you should pick your cover so that the, you know, the things are always transverse to the fibers. Okay, that was not good enough. We have to pick a finer cover. Refine the cover to get, to get convergence. But then once you have this cover, we get convergence. Then you look at the double intersections, so on y, i, j. Remember, these are now the inverse images. These correspond to some polygon p, i, j, which is p, i, in effect, p, j. On this, we now have two complexes. You obtain l, i restricted to y, i, j. l, i is this, that guy over there, for which we made the choice associated to uh, l. And you get l, j associated to yij. But they're not necessarily the same because you may have made different choices for the different fibers. So what relates these two is the continuation map. And but the problem is that even if you know even though you know the differentials here are conversion, the differential here is con the here converge, you may not know that the continuation map converges on yij. But there is a argument analogous to this one, not that I've made this one very precise, but there's an argument analogous to this one to show that, again, on every point in the double intersection, there is some neighborhood so that the continuation map converges on that neighborhood. So you then you do a second refinement of your cover. You cover, you make, you choose your cover sufficiently small, such as all double intersections are sufficiently small. Um, and once you're there, you obtain, you know, you obtain continuation maps. That's good. So you'd like to, so th that gives you just a chain map. Then you'd like to prove that this chain map induces an isomorphism on homology. It's, it's, it's an isomorphism of, at the level of the cohomology sheaves are isomorphic. That requires you to understand this continuation map at the inverse and the one going in, in the other way, and you want to prove that they're both homotopic to the identity. So again, you can't do that on the node. So again, you have to refine the cover. Uh, so I'm just going to skip these steps. And out of this, you can glue cohomology sheets. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. Yes. So now whenever somebody tells you mirror symmetry, that's why I want to start common mixing and then you use mirror symmetry and then you just have the completion of sheets and then you have the sheets. So so this would help if for certain situations you have can give a geometric meaning to this to this problem. Yeah. So with this example to to add this idea. So um I will yeah. So the the, the, the example that this should be applied to um, is, I think I have a second, is the Thurston manifold. <laughs> the example you should be applied to is the Thurston manifold. So the Thurston manifold is a T2, it's just T2 bundle over T2. Twisted T2 bundle over T2. These are uh, where you can. Uh, let's, let's do it. Sim let's do it actually as a Lagrangian. This is not the way it's usually described. Let's use it twisted. Okay. So one thing you could ask what about. What is the example for something 
This is, yes, uh, yes, yeah, I, should, I should say where it came from. So the point is that this, the wonderful thing about this example is that H, uh, it's a format, it's a 2-2 bundle over T2, so it's a four manifold, and it has the wonderful property that H1, uh, H1 has rank three. In fact, with Z coefficients. So it could not possibly, it was a symplectic manifold that was not Kähler. So this is the first example of a non-Kähler symplectic manifold. So um, we know nothing. Well, we know nothing about the Fukai category vector. Okay, we know we have some examples, these fibers, but then we could ask ourselves, kind of, is there a genus two curve in there embedded with some in some homology? You pick the homology class. You'd like to know is there a Lagrangian embedded in there with that homology class? We have no technique for establishing that this doesn't hold. What I the comparison that I want to say is that if you take x, which is t two times t two symplectically, then we do have techniques for saying these things. You say, you ask, you take, you, is there a genus two curve in here? Well, you look at the homology class, okay, it satisfies certain intersection, but what you can do then is you can go to mirror, you go to the mirror and say, well, I'm looking for a sheaf with a certain property. And there, there's lots of obstructions for the existence of sheaves. You can pull it back and it gives you obstructions for the existence of Lagrangian. Here, a priori, there is nothing we could do, okay? But the point is that this has a Lagrangian um, torus vibration, it's ex it exactly fits in the framework what I was talking about. And out of this Lagrangian torus vibration, you can take the dual. <laughs> and the dual is a Kadaira surface. It's a primary Kadaira surface. Well, one, actually there's two different torus vibrations, but one of the choices you can make is you can get a primary Kadaira surface on it. Ah, well this is also a I mean, let's for a moment ignore the fact that we're doing uh, rigid analytic geometry. Let's do the co complex numbers. What is the primary Kadaira surface? Uh, it's also a twisted T2 bundle, T2 bundle over T2, and it also has H1 of X with, R with Z coefficients isomorphic to Z3. It depends which primary Kadaira surface you pick, but anyway. Um, so it was, it's a c an example of a complex manifold that is not, that is not Kähler. Now, you can then translate questions about in from here to questions from here. So for example, um, you know, the, the, there are, and I'll just say, the fact that this complex manifold is not Kähler basically tells you that it does not have that many coherent sheet vectors. And that statement can then be pulled back to this to say that this manifold does not have that many Lagrangians in it. Of course, that doesn't mean it doesn't have many Lagrangians. It basically means it does not have many Lagrangians that have Fleur homology that is, that is well-defined, z squared equals zero. So out of this, if you could implement the whole program, which of course is not nowhere near yet, but if you could implement the whole program, you'd be able to, to, to give uh, you know, information about the symplectic topology of this object from, oh, sorry, that should be y. Um, from coherent sheets on that class. Uh, th and, th and the point is that the current approaches to mirror symmetry would never work for this. There's just no, nothing you could say about this because the current approaches to mirror symmetry always assume that you have enough Lagrangians to basically do something we call resolving the diagonal. You have to be able to express the cohomology of the space in terms of the Hochschild cohomology of the sky category and this is something you cannot do. It is impossible to do on this space. I mean, how do I know that? I know that because it's impossible to do here. It's impossible to do in primary Kähler surface. So that's that's the example that you know, kind of is guiding the desire to have this uh, to have this family Fleur function. 